uh, welcome. Uh, I, I'm Matthew Spaulding. I'm the associate dean, excuse me, the associate vice president and dean for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Uh, as you know, the main campus is out in Michigan, and this is our Washington, D.C. presence. For the, those of you who have not been here before, I extend an, a special welcome uh, to the Allen B. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Uh, we have a great day, some great things going on here. Uh, we have a few sessions this morning with one of myself, one with John Miller, who is running our journalism programs on campus. Uh, this afternoon, you have a tour, uh, but then you're coming back for the dedication of our radio studio on the fourth floor, uh, from which Hugh Hewitt is broadcasting, doing our inaugural broadcast. Uh, then there are some tours this afternoon. Uh, if you've not been here, you should tour and see this facility. If you have been here before, you should still tour and see the facility because uh, we've made some significant changes, both in terms of the classrooms, uh, some office spaces, the radio studio especially, and some other uh, things here in the building. Um, when you come to this building, one of the first things you recognize, hopefully, is the difference this place has in terms of its look. Um, that's by design. If you go to the campus in Hillsdale, you will see the same pattern. Uh, we believe that the look of a place, its architecture, its design, helps uh, point towards the thing that you are emphasizing. Uh, and here, it's intended to do so pointing towards the great things we teach. Uh, when you go around Washington, D.C., Dr. Arnold likes to point out, uh, the ugliest buildings are usually the ones that are the most unconstitutional. <laughs> um, which, which is very true. I've, I've been here for, for some time. Uh, and you go around and look at these absolutely atrocious buildings. Uh, one of the worst, of course, being the Department of Education, which is, which is purely Stalin-esque. Uh, it's, it's just very square and, 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 and faceless. Um, the opposite of that, of course, is the fact that all the most beautiful buildings tend to be the ones that, perhaps not currently, mind you, but in, but in terms of how they're designed, are not designed for a purpose. Uh, and I always point this out to my students and, and uh, especially younger visitors. Uh, you don't necessarily notice these things, uh, but the U.S. Capitol is a great example of that. Uh, the Supreme Court in the National Archives. All of those buildings, although now because of the uh, Department of Homeland Security, they've changed this, which is another, don't get me out going on that one. Um, uh, but all those buildings are designed so that you, you, you walk up to the entrance. You go upstairs, which say it forces you to raise your horizon and raise your perspective. So that you are approaching uh, and, and going up to these great um, monuments of democracy. Um, especially true when you go to the Archives Building, if you've not visited there recently or are, at all. Uh, it's designed as a model, model on the Parthenon uh, in Rome, um, where, of course, the Romans kept the gods they had captured from those they had defeated. That's not what we use the, our Parthenon for. Our National Archives contains our Declaration and our Constitution. But anyway, the, this building is meant to evoke the seriousness with which we pursue our work here in Washington, D.C., and what we, what we teach. Um, we'll have more to say about that this evening. Um, but this place is an extension of the college, an extension of its teaching mission. And so you come here and you see this beautiful facility. It's not a think tank. It's not a law firm. It's not the Department of Education, far from that. Uh, and you come in here to this wonderful room, um, and many speakers we've had here have come to this marvelous room and, and be taken uh, by it, very much so. And you see this wonderful painting behind me, signing of the Constitution. Um, and Sam Connect, uh, on campus, our art teacher, our art, one of our artists, did this painting. And on the last day, September 17, 1787, um, just before the signing uh, of the Constitution, this is the culmination 
of much work. 11 years since the Declaration of Independence, 25 years since the end of the French and Indian War, about 180 years since Jamestown, and much longer, of course, since if you want to go back all the way through the influence of British constitutionalism, Magna Carta, going back to 1215, if you will. One of the greatest turning points in human history. And here they are, celebrating that culminating moment. Uh, you have, and, and we have information on our website and, and a, a pamphlet if you want to see more detail of it. Um, the, the Pennsylvania delegation is over here, although we can see Benjamin Franklin seated in the middle. Uh, back in that back corner, some of the New England delegations. Uh, over here, the three in the corner, these are the three that didn't sign the Constitution. Um, Gary and Randolph, of course, did. The, the two, the one here in the corner, George Mason, farthest in the corner, um, never approved, didn't sign, but also never approved the Constitution later. Uh, Alexander Hamilton in the gold waistcoat here. But of course, the very design of the painting, the angle, is directed towards the two in the middle, uh, those two, two particular figures. And this, this culminating event is largely the results of the collaborative work of all of these individuals, but especially uh, those two. And they're all different. Uh, Hamilton is the brash young man, uh, the bull in the china cabinet in many ways. Uh, brilliant when it comes to economics. Washington's 55 years old, general of the army. There's another painting in the back of the room, also by the same artist, that shows you to scale the height difference. Um, at his death, Washington uh, is either 6'3", perhaps 6'2", 6'3", maybe a little taller even. Uh, but he's robust, natural leader. He embodies the very principles of the American founding. He had a knack for choosing great men. Uh, Jefferson, who's not in this picture, for which we are ever thankful. Uh, he's over in France at the time, so he's not at the Constitutional Convention. The other one who's not here is John Adams, for which we are ever thankful. Um, probably those two would have <laughs> could have potentially prevented this from being successful. Um, but the other one at the center of the painting is a diminutive small man, 5'4", much younger, 36 years old, frail, tended to be sickly, very quiet, and that, of course, is James Madison. Um, today, when we speak of individuals, we talk about leadership. That's the word of the day. We here tend to speak and like to talk about statesmanship. Uh, there's a profound difference between those two things. And one of the essential things we wish to teach our students, uh, the public who are looking at these things going on today, and of course those who are actually leading, is to take this other view. Um, leadership, it's a modern idea, actually comes from the progressives, who I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, the, the idea of leadership is you are leading along a path uh, but you're following something else. Uh, their great analogy is the idea of kind of following history, following the river as it goes down the stream. Uh, but statesmanship is a different thing. It's a classical idea. It goes back to the ancients. Uh, it, the idea is, it, is that you have a permanent thing which you have as your objective that gives you a sense of where you're going, and you orient it, all of your politics towards that thing. Uh, the classical analogy you see in Aristotle and Cicero and all the other classical writers uh, is the idea of a ship on the sea. You guide yourself by the stars, by the permanent things, uh, to help you, give you that sense of direction. So Washington, the father of the country, Madison, the father of the Constitution, Hamilton, Franklin. Franklin is gesturing towards the two in the center. Their North Star was this, this culminating event. 
the preservation of this thing, the perpetuation of it, all the work that taught, took them to get there. And yet we must remember that just months before this event, and those years before this event, going back to the Declaration, the end of the French and Indian War, and the years before that, um, it was not at all clear that this event would be successful. Indeed, if anything, it was actually quite doubtful. What they reflect, and why we study them, and why we look back to them not as merely historical figures, but as examples for today, is that statesmanship. What they produced, their culminating North Star, is precisely what is at stake today. Not the document, not the piece of paper, not the historical idea of it, but the larger question they ask, beginning of the Federalist Papers, which is, can we govern ourselves? And if so, how? Can we design a regime by which man can govern themselves and allow for sufficient freedom for them to pursue their happiness? And can we perpetuate it? To do so, as then, so today, will take statesmanship. Individuals who have a deep sense of the principles and where they're going and are clever and strategic and thoughtful about how to get there. Let me say a few things about America, and then I want to come back to our friends, the progressives, and then talk about some of our dilemmas today. Because at, at Hillsdale, we teach, and our curriculum, our work, is centered around the liberal arts, which is, say, centered around learning the permanent things literature, history. But the key difference is you learn those permanent things so you can know how to do and live your life according to them today, which demands a perspective of both then but also now. What's different about this country is not just the fact that it's ours, but it makes certain and different claims certain claims about principles, about these very things that direct the statesman. We see them most famously, of course, in the Declaration of Independence. This idea that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That our perspective on politics and our lives should be oriented towards a recognition of the laws of nature and of nature's God. We speak a lot today, and you hear candidates constantly talk about American exceptionalism. I'm not sure they quite understand the sense in which America is exceptional. It has to do with these deeper groundings. We talk a lot about first principles. The word principle is an old Latin word, first coined by Cicero. Uh, but it comes from the use of the Roman legions. <clears throat> that is, when the Romans made their encampments, they put at the center of their encampment all the symbols and flags of Rome to signify what they fought for. And that place was called a principia, from which Cicero got the word principles. This unique sense of the American founding, the idea that we have a founding itself, a classical idea. France doesn't have a founding. Germany doesn't have a founding. America has a founding. It's orienting towards these core principles of human liberty, of the idea that we are equal and that equality is grounded in something other than merely a claim. Prior to the American founding, people were subjects, which meant you were subject to the king or some other authority. There was no such thing as citizenship. Citizenship, the idea of modern citizenship, begins 
when, this, when these Americans, informed by other thought, going all the way back to the Greeks and Romans, for sure, but the Americans for the first time decided to build a country based on this idea and build their laws around it. And from this idea, there are rights grounded in nature that we equally possess as humans. No one is born, as Jefferson liked to say, booted and spurred. None with a saddle on his back. We are equal. And because we are equal, the only way to proceed, the only fair way to proceed, is through the consent of the governed. The two great rights of the American founding, there are others, but they were only interested in, they only wanted to secure the most important and significant of them. One is a floor and one is a ceiling. The floor is a claim of property. You have your property, which say you may own and sell, you may acquire, by virtue of the fact you have mixed your labor with it. And because of that, it becomes yours. You've mixed it with the sweat of your brow. It's the first principle of liberty. The ceiling, then, is religious liberty, religious freedom. You have a right to pursue your relationship with the divine. In the ancient world, your gods were the gods of your city, Sparta or Athens. And when your city was defeated, your gods were defeated. This, of course, changes with Judaism and Christianity. But the Americans, Washington famously says, I took to the field for the sake of civil and religious liberty. The Americans had a different idea, that you each, because of your human nature, had a fundamental right to your religious freedom. There's a second set of ideas that we wrap around the Constitution. We are all created equal, and we all can consent to the governed. How then do you do that? It took them 11 years to get there. They had to go through the Articles of Confederation, but they eventually came to the Constitution. Of course, in doing so, they had inherited the rule of law from the British. It predates the American founding. It goes back far. We adjusted that. The British have no written constitution. One of the reasons why Britain is in such a bad shape is precisely because once their laws have changed, their laws are merely the slow evolution of time, it's very hard to turn them back. We insisted on a written constitution. By virtue of the Declaration, we possess rights. Governments merely possess powers. We see that in the opening clauses of the Constitution. Power is delegated by virtue of those rights. And furthermore, those powers are all separated, divided, checked, and balanced. James Madison, the other founders throughout the Federalist Papers, tell us don't rely on parchment barriers. Look to its structure. Parchment barriers are not enough. And so he designed auxiliary precautions, representation, federalism, the separation of powers, all the things to secure our independence so that we could be self-governing and pursue happiness. One of my favorite stories that I found uh, long ago and I put in one of my uh, previous books was a story of a young man named Levi, Levi Preston. He serves at the Battle of Concord. It goes to this point. He's later interviewed by a historian who wants to know, why did you go fight at the Battle of Concord? You're fighting against the greatest and most powerful military force in the world. And he went to the Battle of Concord untrained, with a gun left over from the French and Indian War. Small number of people against a large contingent of the British coming from Boston through Lexington, where the first shots had been fired. Why did you fight at the Battle of Concord, the historian asked Levi Preston. Surely you objected, objected to the tea tax. I didn't drink tea, he said. 
Then it was the Stamp Act. You objected to the Stamp Act, having to pay your taxes and show a stamp. I didn't object that much to that as well. It didn't bother me that much. Well, surely you read all those books, those, those books of Republican theory. I didn't read those, said Levi Preston. I read the Bible and Psalms. What was it, the historian wanted to know, flustered, very simple, said Levi Preston. We had always governed ourselves. We intended to do so. And those redcoats didn't think that we should. I like that story because to my students it points out we don't have hindsight, neither did Levi Preston. We have times to look backward to find his, uh, explanations about history. But it's especially important to point out for him, it was a very simple idea that we wanted to govern ourselves. The argument of the American founding, this idea of rights expressed in the Declaration, grounded in nature, giving rights to consent, and constitutionalism of its particular structure, its complicated way that Madison designs, all of that today is precisely is what is debated. At the time of the founding, up through the end of the 19th century, through the Civil War, it was a consensus. The Civil War is fought over that. It's the great exception that proves the rule. Jefferson and Hamilton, they debated everything. And they disagreed about everything. But they agreed on the most important things. You can't find a writing of Hamilton's on the rights of man that is any less beautiful than the greatest writings of Jefferson. It was after the Civil War that this all changes. As is often the case, people started looking elsewhere. The Civil War, the general opinion was, happened because the Constitution failed. It hadn't worked to prevent the Civil War. We must look elsewhere. After the Civil War, there was, was the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And the Constitution is a barrier preventing change. We must look elsewhere. And so they did, many of them traveling to Europe, Britain, France, especially Germany, to find a new political science that they could use to design a new way of running government. There they learned many things, studying with German political thinkers. I'll just mention two. One is, there's no fixed truth anymore. This idea that politics can be based on recognized, self-evident truths makes no sense. Karl Becker, a famous progressive, once wrote in a book about the Declaration of Independence that to ask whether the Declaration is true or not is a meaningless question. And secondly, they talked about evolution and progress by which they meant everything changes. Not only are there no permanent fixed truths, but there are no contingent truths for that matter. They change over time. Nice truths in the 19th century, the 20th century, but they too will change. The idea of a fixed human nature to base your politics on, the idea of property rights, religious liberty, all of that is in question. The Constitution, which must be made into a living document, the origins of the idea of the living constitution come from progressive jurisprudence. And this structure of the constitution, which Madison and all the others talk about at great length, had to be changed in favor of a new form of government, which they called, and we sometimes now call, administration, or more derogatively, bureaucracy. They were much, very much enamored with the idea of science. And this science, especially new sciences, would lead us to better, better, excuse me, better and better ways to design things, to greater improvements, to progress. Progress with a capital P, change in and of itself. No coincidence that about this time, in the 1860s, is when Charles Darwin is first writing about evolution. The progressives are studying in Europe and Germany in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, they bring this home to begin the progressive movement. 
But as a result, everything needs to be rethought. All the arguments of the founders, philosophical grounding, its practical design, must all be rethought. This idea of administration becomes a crucial element to that. If man has an equal nature, his passions can also be checked by government, but otherwise you want to leave him as free and possible to self-govern. But if science tells us that we can perfect human nature and make it better, what we need are more and more people who have been trained as experts to rule. The battle we face today is essentially a battle between two graduates of Princeton University. James Madison graduated from Princeton in 1771. He studied with John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration. Woodrow Wilson graduated from Princeton in 1879. The difference between their two educations is fundamental. Madison's was still within the moral framework, the moral horizon by which the founders designed the Constitution, morally grounded in the principles of the Declaration. Wilson, however, is of the new progressive mind. We see this debate between the two graduates of Princeton playing out over the course of the 20th century. The progressive movement in the early part of the century, the New Deal, but especially the Great Society and things happening in the 1960s and 70s. Today, I would suggest to you, many of the things we see and find increasingly objectionable are the fruits of all that. That's not to say that these ideas in this debate of ideas plays out directly. Fits and starts over time. But we have to understand its grounding. In the 1960s and 60s and 70s, there was a turn to this idea of administration once again, and more and more is thought that things had to be done society-wide and comprehensively. Clean the air, clean the water. Congress, over the course of the 20th century, increasingly delegated its powers, the powers in the Constitution, to regulators, to those experts that the progressives wanted. Legislation today, of course, is a great example of all of that. In many ways, much worse. The ACA, or Obamacare, the sixth of the economy, but over 100 agencies run it. Little or nothing occurs outside of that regulation. Dodd-Frank, of course, financial uh, regulations, even worse. 2,300 pages. If you ever read it, which I hope you do not, <laughs> these laws today, in many ways, do not meet the classic definition of law. They are instructions to rule makers. Dodd-Frank is a perfect example of that. But it has one part, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, which is especially egregious. It contains its own funding mechanism. It is not subject to congressional oversight. And it has the power to interpret its own regulations. The point is this debate between Madison and Wilson has come to a place where we need to decide which direction we wish to go. The Madisonian uh, world is increasingly being overwhelmed by a Wilsonian world. A few years ago, Congress passed on average about 200 laws, only 50 of which were serious laws. You had, to, you had to set aside all the namings of post offices. Amounts to about 3,000 pages of law. The same year, regulators put out 80,000 pages of regulations. The fact that we speak today about a new imperial presidency is entirely predictable, given how much Congress has delegated and given away to the administration. 
giving presidents much discretion. Now granted, recent presidents have learned to do it with or without that discretion by amendment and changing laws and perhaps even rewriting them. But the point is this is a new form of governing, governing by regulation and administration. We face two crises today. Abraham Lincoln, one of his famous speeches, begins with the opening line, if we could only know where we are and whither we are tending, we would know what to do and how to do it. Much simpler said than done. But this is where we are, and we are tending towards that way. The first crisis I think we face is which, ones, which form of government will we be ruled by? It's a question of the bureaucracy versus self-government. Bureaucracy increasingly encompasses everything. We, of course, think of the debt and spending and the trend we are on there. But it is hard to imagine today something that is not covered by bureaucracy in the regulatory state. We need to focus on that as the question of our politics. And I think that's how the founders would look at it. At the end of Democracy America, Tocqueville warns, actually, of forms of soft despotism. But it has to do with us being ruled by science and being less self-governing. But the second crisis I think we face is how to think about it. We oftentimes tend to be drawn towards legalistic ways of looking at questions, technical ways, looking for silver bullets and easy fixes. But these are fundamental regime questions. They're very definitional, about principle. But we also find ourselves in very difficult circumstances. Here, I think we actually have a guide, which is the Constitution itself. Not as a legal document, mind you, but as a framework not about its parchment, but because of its structure, its institutions, its coordinate branches, its powers and responsibilities, checks and balances. We have a problem of an imperial presidency, but we need to have a better understanding of what the executive power is. But that imperial presidency is largely responsible for us overlooking, oftentimes, a complete and utter collapse of Congress. That's the first branch, the first among equals. The problem is that it no longer makes laws. But that is its very duty and its source of its powers. It has delegated too much over the years, over the decades, and it needs to regain, regain its control. It has especially lost control of the budget process. It does things by continuing resolutions now. It doesn't authorize and appropriate anymore. But also by rebuilding Congress, you shift authority to where individuals who have been elected in a representative can actually make practical decisions about some of the hard questions we make. And you rebuild an institution which increasingly can be a check against the modern executive. Doing so will require constitutional strategies and statesmanship. Recall that prudence is the classical virtue of politics. It's got a bad name today. We think of prudes. But it's a virtue. Courage, another virtue, has to be able to balance between cowardice and foolhardiness. And it's prudence that dictates. It's a practical wisdom about contingent things. It sometimes is incremental. Think of how Henry Clay, the great statesman, dealt with questions of slavery in the 19th century. But it's oftentimes and must of necessity be very bold as well. Think of Lincoln, the founders themselves. Federalist One says that it has been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable of not, or not 
of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend upon their political circumstances on accident and force. There is truth in this remark, the crisis at which we arrived may, may with propriety be regarded as the time when the decision is to be made. That is the same circumstance we are in today. We have two things going for us. One, I think people are increasingly objecting to bureaucratic rule. There's something inhuman about being ruled by a National Department of Motor Vehicles. It's no longer the case that individual bureaucratic rule is not seen to be connected to its other aspects. It is incomprehensive. Churchill once said that people are easy to lead, but they are hard to drive. And all of this drives towards elections, which is to say the place where the American people can voice their opinions and show their frustrations. Secondly, we have faced crises in the past. There's still an overwhelming sense among the American people that this is a unique country, despite the fact that more and more of them, in poll after poll, suggest and believe it is no longer abiding by the consent of the governed. But the fact is that America's principles, its constitution, the truths proclaimed and etched in the human heart are all still there for recovery. We sometimes have a sense of inevitability that all is lost and that things can't be turned. Joseph Warren, who was in Boston after the Battles of Concord and the American Revolutionaries came back to oppose the British who had taken up force there, was in charge of the defenses of Boston in the face of the English. He, of course, went and fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill, better called Breed's Kill, more accurately. And the British attacked them, not once, not twice, but three times before the American defenses were overwhelmed. Warren, in that attack, was immediately killed by the British because they knew what he was up to. This is something he wrote a month before he was killed. Our streets are filled with armed men. Our harbor is crowded with ships of war. But these cannot intimidate us. Our liberty must be preserved. It is far dearer than life. No longer could we reflect with generous pride on the heroic actions of our forefathers if we but for a moment entertain the thought of giving up our liberty. Our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends determining to be free, and heaven and earth will aid the resolution. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. What we can do, and what we here at Hillsdale especially focus on, is constantly pointing out why this country is worthy of saving, why it needs saving, and what can be done to save it, trying to put together arguments for constitutional reconstruction. And we can do so all the while by forming and shaping the character of our students and of citizens, and yes, of statesmen who will do so. In the meantime, we can better ourselves so that we are worthy of the Founders' Constitution. Thank you. So we have time for some questions before our, our next session. Bob. In your opinion, what would you say is Paul Ryan's North 
Good question. What is Paul Ryan's North Star? Um, let me make a broader comment first. I think one of the most promising situations right now is the fact that um, the first, you've had turnover in the House in terms of the speakership, but it's being driven now by this discussion about rules. Uh, the more I've thought about it, it's, it's a perfect Madisonian argument, which is to say that it's the structural rules which should drive one towards an outcome. Um, uh, and with a looser, with a less um, firmly directed speakership, uh, I think there'll be a lot more influence by more people in the House caucus. Uh, in terms of uh, Ryan himself, I think we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the speakership, the modern speakership, is a very difficult office. The last person who was speaker and later elected president of the United States was in 1844. You have to think hard to think of the last speaker who retired um, happy. <laughs> um, ha having said that, I think I, I would put him down as an example of someone who is grappling as best he can towards um, uh, a better constitutional outcome. I think the problem we face today, uh, yes, there are a lot of differences on particulars, and on tactics, but, there's a, but the large movement we have is back towards reestablishing the rule of law uh, and establishing the authority of Congress. Because only by reestablishing the authority of Congress as an institution uh, can you actually revive the separation of powers, check the executive, start thinking forward about what you're going to do with the courts? Right? Um, and in that sense, talking about the institution, talking about rules, uh, I think is a precise way to do that. Perhaps when you think they can. <laughs> Fair enough. Could we simplify the front part of your lecture by saying that in many countries the oath of fealty or loyalty is taken to a queen, a king, or a fuhrer, whereas here the oath that many of us in the room have probably taken is to protect and defend the Constitution? No, that's right, that's right. So e even during the American Revolution, right, uh, George Washington institutes the first oath but it's not an oath to him, right? This is even before the Constitution. Uh, it's an oath to the, 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 the Continental Congress, right? Absolutely, and, and that's, that's the fundamental difference, right? Uh, in this country, uh, the, the, the regime and, and our oath is oriented around that document, the principles it secures. You're on. Uh, I think we expect some um, recognitions from the Supreme Court in the new maybe years. Is there anything to prevent us from reducing the number on the court? And I say that with an agenda in mind because right. those have probably the only design. Although, although, although Antonin Scalia is getting pretty old. That's what the miracles of, of modern science has kept them ticking. There, 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 there's, no, there's no reason why you can't change the numbers in the Supreme Court. This is, of course, what Franklin Roosevelt tried to do by packing the court. Uh, the problem is that it would be extremely difficult not to see that for a political move. Um, uh, you know, I, the, the, um, so whether you could get any interest in that on either side, I think, would be, would be difficult. Uh, I think the harder question will be, uh, the, the, we focus on all this interest going on now in the House of Representatives, uh, but I'm increasingly worried about the Senate. Um, and the reason there is, again, going back to a structural point. Um, the Senate has had a tradition, not grounded in the Constitution itself, 
uh, but rules, which is a modern tradition of the filibuster. Uh, it was meant to allow a minority of particular senators from particular states to stop legislation. Um, but it's now being used on a regular, everyday basis to stop anything from happening. Uh, from a Madisonian point of view, that, I find that very problematic and distressful. Um, that would become a factor with Supreme Court nominations. I'm not sure how that plays out. Um, I think the problem we, we have is that Supreme Court nominations have become increasingly, um, for good reason, uh, focused on uh, philosophical understandings of the Constitution. I think conservatism, if there was one thing I would criticize, has been the appointment of Supreme Court justices. For all the great success of originalism in, in law schools, it has not played out well when it comes to actual judicial nominations. Um, I think that actually has something to do with a misunderstanding of constitutionalism. Right? It's, it's focused, focused too much on kind of technical constitutionalism and not made a broad argument for polit political constitutionalism. Um, so I'm not sure how good of a shape we are when it comes to, to our um, uh, judicial nominations. The best ones, and there are some very good ones on the Supreme Court, um, have almost oftentimes come up because of chance. Not because of them, but because of the circumstances. Um, we don't have a great track record. So, so, but to, if you want to change, change the numbers in the court, it's, it's perfectly legal to do so. It's perfectly, the, con, the, yeah, the act of Congress can, can change the numbers in the court. Um, but, uh, you know, you decrease it or increase it a little bit. I'm not sure whose advantage that'll play out to. I'm getting into a political discussion here, partisan. From your own observations of all of the candidates that have expressed themselves, particularly on the public side, which of any of them really seem to understand and articulate the founding principles? Um, <laughs> on the one, not to get partisan, right? Um, uh, it's, you know, the, the ones that are doing so, they're trying to do so. I mean, I think probably, uh, you know, Ted Cruz, he's, he's uh, a very fine legal mind, he's studied uh, these questions um, would probably be the best example. Um, I think the larger problem we have is that the way this debate is occurring is not allowing for any serious discussion of anything. Um, and that should be our biggest disappointment. I don't think it's that we don't have... Uh, I think the, 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 the candidates, as opposed to four years ago, are better, it's a better field and yet it's becoming a complete debacle. The, the, the objective, my objective, and the objective of being here in Washington for Hillsdale College uh, is not to pick candidates. Um, it's not to pick judges, for that matter. It's to take any of them and try to make them better. Um, the best ones will come forward. Uh, we will help that. But then what you want are a lot of others to help them. It's always been the case that in most politics, going back to the very beginning, that most politicians look at it as a politician. And they don't have a high horizon. It's all about getting reelected. It's all about their narrow interests. That's probably not going to change any time in the future because of human nature. What you want to make sure is that you have people who are capable of giving them some direction and argue that their interest should point in a different direction. Right. So what you do is you try to focus on the ones that have the most promise and make them better to guide the others. And you start a movement. Right. And that's generally how politics tends to work. I don't, the question was about term limits. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Think about, I mean, I'm generally opposed to term limits. And here's why. Think it through. Right? Um, if you have someone who's good, you should reelect them. Right? And, and if there's one thing that the people have a sovereign right to, it's to decide who is 
their elected representatives. Right? Well, I, 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 I'm not disagreeing with, I'm, I'm just, you know, you, you, it's the same thing with the filibuster. I argue with uh, friends around town with the filibuster all the time. What you should try to do is try to get them to th rethink these things. In the current circumstances, you need to rethink a lot of these questions. Um, where there have been um, term limits established at the state level, they've tended not to work very well. In California, spending goes up, and they figured out how to do rotation in office. And also, when you institute term limits, who does that empower? The staff who become a permanent bureaucratic establishment. Right? My general argument is that the best thing we could do, which I think is the Madisonian argument, is to make things more political, not less. To make things more partisan, not less. That's not to say the political parties as they're currently instituted are very good. Right, but you want to open up so there's a public debate that has political ramifications. Right? And so trying to focus on a particular solution, oftentimes we, 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 we overlook the larger thing that I think is the solution. Um, when, when Madison and Jefferson founded the first political parties in opposition to the Federalists and the John Adams administration going into the election of 1800, what did they do? Well, they drug their feet. They, they uh, made arguments, right? but more is they organized and they made uh, a case to the American people that drove towards the election of 1800, in which they won the presidency and control of Congress. Jenny. Um, this is a fabulous lecture. I really appreciate that thing you're doing and Hillsdale is doing in this town. Um, talk about the parties a little bit, which you were going is an empty vessel now, and it's taking shots at those who believe in founding principles. And, and so that's the reason you saw the banner demise, in my opinion. And so is it time for a new party? And even though that wouldn't help us in 2016, maybe, which we need that to work for the survival of the country, what's your, what's your sense of the parties? Um, no, you're absolutely right about political parties, right? The, 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 the um, problem is that one of the two political parties has essentially become the party of the state. This is a very European tradition, right? In Europe, you tend to have a, a one party that has become the, is the party of the, of, of the state, of the administration. That's very much so today. Um, we don't have an active two-party system anymore. Um, uh, and the other party, the Republicans, I think, are uh, having, at the very least, a very intense internal debate um, in which one group, I think, wants to be the party, not necessarily of the state, but at least of, of in power, uh, which tends to mitigate those who want to push it in a different direction. Uh, you have a large and hopefully growing segment within the Republicans who want to change the direction of the country. The question is, how do you go about doing that? Um, the, the other problem you have is that in, a, in the way the system is designed, the way Madison designed the system, it's designed for a two-party system. Right? Um, uh, the, the, this interesting back and forth about rules in Congress versus a strong speakership, right? that kind of uh, part of Boehner's uh, decline, but also this challenge for someone like Paul Ryan, is you have a very practical situation which is that Congress is Congress and it's not Parliament, right? Which is to say that it won't work here to have a, um, to try to turn Congress into a Parliament because we're not a multi-party system, right? A majority rules, because Congress is designed for a majority. Um, that's your two-party system problem. So the, the idea of, of, of um, shaping the two parties is the way that these movements normally operate. And I think it's still, un, 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 until you've come to the point where everything is hopeless, uh, is still the way those ideas will be translated. Congress, the Electoral College, elections demand what? Creating majorities. That's how they design the system in order to 
um, ensure that a majority of the American people are with your changes. Um, which is to say that the Madisonian answer, I think, the Madisonian uh, argument would be, well, we need to go out and convince more Americans about the direction of our country and why it needs to be turned. Right? Uh, simple as that. The problem with third parties, or the problem with turning Congress into Parliament, is that you also have the challenge or the possibility of, of making yourself more and more of a minority party, and you go into oblivion. It's a very fine line. Um, how you transition from, that's why historically in America, we've never had three parties of any significance. What happens is one party tends to go away, but they're replaced by a new party, which largely picks up most of that first party. That's a different model that I think is more uh, possible, but even then you would still have to essentially reinvent the existing party because of its structure. Anyway, that's all. Anything else? Last question? Yes. How are you going to counter the lack of education that's occurring in our colleges? You all have been talking about teaching your students. There are many, many universities and colleges that are not doing their job. So we are raising a whole group, a whole generation of illiterates in history and constitution. How are you going to counter that? Well, wh one thing we do is we make Hillsdale better and better and better as a competitive model. Um, uh, we've gone on to, we do a lot of more work on online. Uh, we have started a set of uh, charter schools to affect education prior to going into college. Uh, and we're increasingly getting involved in and want to be involved in battles over things like AP history standards and the Common Core, right, educational issues. Uh, it's the same thing, however. Um, the, the issue of what students are being taught um, needs to be more front and center, but then you need to have an alternative to how to do it well and to show what those arguments are. So one of the, I think one of the major arguments about what a Hillsdale College can do is to, is to show how you can teach the students effectively these principles in an intelligent way. Uh, and we do that publicly. Uh, we do that uh, beyond that. And then we come to a place like this and make those same arguments. Um, uh, what I find is, and I, I spend a lot of my time working with uh, staff who work on the Hill, which are a year or two out of college. Right? They tend to be, uh, they, they tend to have, had gone through those educations. Um, but what I find is they yearn for a better argument. They yearn to know these arguments. Uh, and these principles in this history. And they're very open to hearing it, if for no other reason because it's something different than what they were taught, and they find it very attractive. Uh, and if we can present that argument in a very um, aspirational sense, right, uh, I think we can be much more successful at it. Um, there are lots of, um, uh, there are very few Hillsdales, but there are a lot of places where there are centers on college campuses. Um, uh, Robbie George, Robert George, up at Princeton University, has one of the most successful centers on a college campus, the James Madison program up there. Um, you can replicate that model as much as you can. Uh, but there are, I think there are more things that we could do and, and, and can be doing uh, to turn that, turn that around.